Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for uh, coming up to the table today. It was really fun hearing everybody's stories about what, what it was like playing my games. Sometimes with the parents, sometimes with the parents not knowing. <laughs> um, so, uh, so let me talk about the id Software's early days. I'm a co-founder of id Software, and I'm going to take you on a journey back to the beginning of the company's formation. Are you ready to be entertained? <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I do realize, uh, there's a lot of devs here, I do realize that there's, uh, that, that some of what I'm about to say may sound insane. But we were in our 20s when we started in software, and we didn't know there were any limits. <laughs> um, so I grew up in a wonderful small town in Northern California. It was named Rockland, and the population was 6,000 back then. In the 70s, I was massively addicted to spending loads of time in dark arcades and playing all of the games there and getting really good at them. In 1979, before anyone had a computer at home, really, including me, I went to local college when I was 11 years old, and I started learning basic from the college students. I basically just walked up to them, and I asked them what the words on their listings meant, <laughs> and I wrote them all down, and I experimented with them on the HP 9000 mainframe that they had there at the college. And to keep me at home, my parents got me an Apple II Plus. I was done going outside. <laughs> I spent all my time programming games on that computer. So a few years, and about 20 Apple II games later, I finally learned 6502 assembly language, the language that all fast arcade games were written in. Then I could really make 80s games like these. Uh, but not quite arcade games, you know, but home computer games, which were on the Apple II. And let's just say the Apple II was my personal home arcade, um, as well as only one more million uh, Apple II users back then. <laughs> so when I was a sophomore in high school, I did some programming for the Air Force uh, when I was 15 years old. We lived in England then, and my stepfather worked for the Air Force. Uh, in order to get into the high school coding class, I showed my teacher that I could program in 6502 assembly language, and I ended up at the aggressor squadron the next day. <laughs> I was literally, literally coding in a vault because I was a kid, they gave me false data to use with my code. I can't tell you what I was programming. That's classified. <laughs> but uh, a very odd but true story. Um, and then after high school, I kept making games. And by 1987, I was working at Origin Systems. And my first job was porting 2400 AD from the Apple II to the Commodore 64 computer. And by this time, I had made 74 games and three previous game startup companies uh, which were called Capital Ideas Software, Inside Out Software, where I ported Might and Magic 2 to the Commodore 64, uh, and Ideas from the Deep, and I was 21 years old. So I went to work at a company called Softdisk at the start of 1989. I learned how to program a DOS PC there and made you know, a small game or a utility every single month for about a year. And then I created a product at that company called Gamer's Edge and I had to hire a team of game developers, a very small team. So I hired John Carmack and uh, Adrian Carmack, who are not related, into my department for programming and art, and Tom Hall came in at night to help us out since he was already at Soft across the hall, and he loved making games. And this was the first time that any of us had actually worked with another person on a game uh, after making them alone for 10 years. That's what it was like in the 80s. It was programming alone. Um, but it was incredible when we got together. So while creating our first game, uh, it was called Slordax, John Carmack discovered this smooth scrolling trick uh, on the PC. So Tom Hall and John stayed up just one random night, um, stayed up until 5 AM making this demo uh, that they called Dangerous Dave in Copyright Infringement. <laughs> the, the, the next day, I saw this disc on my desk, um, and I ran the demo, and I watched the screen scroll smoothly, pixel by pixel, and it was a massive eureka moment for me. It was like a bolt of lightning hit, and I'll elaborate on why it was in a moment. But id Software was born that instant on September 20th of 1990. So one thing led to another, and we spent about a week putting together 
a demo of Super Mario Brothers 3 for Nintendo on a PC, which they liked. We sent it to them. They liked it, but they decided not to publish it because they decided to only publish their games on their own NES platform, which was a smart move. <laughs> no problem. We just used the technology for a different game, for the Commander Keen trilogy, the very first Commander Keen trilogy that we made. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, you know, why would a side-scroller be a huge hit on PCs in 1990? Well, it's because no games on the PC could, small, could scroll smoothly, horizontally, <laughs> per pixel at the time. Uh, the PC had been out since August of 1981, but in nine years, no one had ever figured out how to make the screen scroll smoothly that way until this dangerous day in copyright infringement demo, which then led to Commander Keen. So the Commander Keen trilogy provided the start of the company, and we made these three games in three months, from September 20th to December 14th, 1990, when we released uh, Commander Keen. So it was a massive hit for us, and it was so popular that people cosplayed as Keen for years at events, and they still are. So this game pioneered the creation of game engines. So we designed the game as an engine that operated on different data for different games. It was the only way that we could get this trilogy done so quickly. In fact, in 1991, when we were working on Keen 4, we started licensing the engine for the first time and it was the beginning of this modern engine licensing biz, which today is you know, dominated by Unity and Unreal. So development on our games went very smoothly and quickly because we stuck to some core principles that are important even today. So through this talk, I'm gonna highlight some of our core principles. I'd also like to highlight something else, namely this photo. <laughs> Has anyone ever seen this photo before? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> it's hidden on the internet. There's a picture of us at our lake house in Shreveport, Louisiana, where we started in software. So the funny thing is that people have asked me uh, for years, uh, you know, game developers are asking, like, what is in this picture? Like, what are, what are all these things? Um, so I analyzed it recently, and, and here's what you see. This is uh, me and John in early September of 1990. We we're working on the Super Mario 3 demo that we planned on sending to Nintendo. We both worked on this huge Dungeons and Dragons table that John had. Um, we used to play D&D on the weekends, and those sessions led to ideas for future games like Doom and Quake, actually. So Tom Hall took this photo. Um, the computers there were brought home from work on the weekends because we didn't have PCs. <laughs> so this photo was taken on a Saturday or a Sunday. <laughs> Uh, on top of the monitor is one of those Intel reflective astronaut plushies. It was part of a marketing campaign back then. Probably don't remember that. Um, and to my left is a notepad, which was like a task list of bugs to fix. And then this is our high-level task list, <laughs> which of what we had to get done to finish the demo. Um, th and this is Tom Hall's area uh, on the right, where he was doing all the graphics for this demo. He recorded gameplay um, of Super Mario Brothers 3 on a VCR. <laughs> And he played it back, and he's pausing the action so he could duplicate the tiles exactly in Deluxe Paint 2. The TV set that he was playing it on had a 13-channel selector on it and was connected by an RF modulator. <laughs> Very old school. So id Software was formally founded on February 1st of 1991, and we made 13 games that year. Uh, Shadow Knights, Dangerous Dave in the Haunted Mansion, we, you know, all these games uh, that you see here, plus three other ones, I think, or, or a few others that aren't not shown here for um, the Apple II. So we actually took two months for each game, but we made two games at the same time, at least two. Um, and this was due to us having 10 years of intense game development experience prior. Um, but it was also due to one of our first principles, which was no prototypes. <laughs> Just make the game. Polish as you go. Do not depend on polish happening later. <laughs> Always maintain constantly shippable code. This is basically how we made games so quickly back then. We knew what the game was. We had it in our minds. And we just needed to quantify what needed to be done. And we went about working on it until the game was finished. There were no prototypes for our games. We just made them. 
Um, but remember, you know, this is a small team of four people, <laughs> and we could do this in large teams, obviously require planning and prototypes. But that's what we, that's what we did back then. Uh, time for a quick story. So one day, it rained really hard in Shreveport. Uh, in uh, Cross Lake, which is where our lake house was, it was flooding everywhere, and I really needed to get to work. We were furiously working away on our games, and I just had to get back to coding. So I just got ready for work and drove down the street, and this is what I saw. The entire road was just flooded for, uh, I couldn't even see the end of it. Well, I waded through that, <laughs> that flood, and water snakes and everything else that's coming out of that. There was crocodiles out there too. Um, all the way to the house and basically took another shower <laughs> and I got back to work. We were so excited to be making our own games in our own company 24 seven. And also note that during this year of all these games, we moved id Software from Louisiana to Wisconsin, which does take a bit of time out of game development. Um, so we couldn't afford to have anything go wrong while we we're making our games. So, you know, at this crazy fast pace. So we created another principle that kept us developing quickly. Uh, it's incredibly important that your game can be run by your team all the time. Bulletproof your engine by providing defaults on load failure. So if you have 100 people developing a game and it won't run, then you're paying for 100 people to sit around and wait for it to get fixed. So we recognize the importance of making sure that the game will always run, and uh, decided to just bulletproof our engine by making all input solid. So game engines typically fail because they can't load, they're loading bad, corrupted, or non-existent data. And so checking for this and providing a default for failure uh, will keep the game always running. Uh, you know, and also, you gotta make sure it's showing you what's missing. So if you fail to load a sprite, basically show a bagel. If the theme song's not loading, play something really wrong and obnoxious. Uh, missing sound effect, same thing. So after 1991, its software's first stage of company development was complete, and another important principle was in effect. Keep your code absolutely simple. Keep looking at your functions and figure out how you can simplify further. We wrote all of our games all the way up to Quake in C, not C++. Okay, so stage two is about to begin. In August of 1991, we decided to move to Madison, Wisconsin. Tom and I visited at that time, and we found it to be really nice. You know, Tom used to live there while he was in college. He grew up in Wisconsin. So we moved all four of us up there, and we started working on our games. Only four months later, we're found dead in the snow, <laughs> victims of Wisconsin's brutal winters that we did not research, and Tom did not tell us. <laughs> Moral of the story, do your research. We knew how to program an assembly language, but not how to ask Tom, hey, what are winters like up here? <laughs> so after six months of this garbage, we moved down to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we have a new principle. Great tools help make great games. Uh, spend as much time on tools as possible. I wrote a tile editor back in 1991 named Ted. <laughs> tile editor. Uh, Ted was used for 33 shipped retail games, um, several of which were actually 3D games, like Hover Tank, Catacomb 3D, Wolfenstein 3D, Spear of Destiny, Rise of the Triad, Cor Corridor 7, and some others. So it was January, it's 1992. We decided to go all 3D based on Catacomb 3D's Promise. So it was a game that we made um, at the end of, you know, for October and November of 1991. It looked really cool, it just didn't play really cool. Um, so Wolfenstein 3D was a game that we made. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wolfenstein took four months of development to make the shareware version. Uh, we made the shareware version and then we launched the game um, with one episode of Levels. And it took us two more months to finish all six episodes and the hint book that goes with it. In the first month, it sold 4,000 copies, all priced at 60 bucks each. Yeah, math. <laughs> so, so Spear of Destiny took two months. We made that right after Wolfenstein. Uh, it's a prequel to Wolfenstein, and it was retail only. And soon after, Tom Hall traveled to Kentucky to work for a couple months on Wolfenstein VR. Yes, this was 1992 VR. <laughs> 
So back in the days of Commander Keen, I discovered a small three-person game company called Raven Software in Madison, Wisconsin. I called them up, we went over, we introduced ourselves to them, flash forward seven months later, and we did a little bit of work with them by modifying the Wolfenstein 3D engine and licensed it to them for a game called Shadowcaster. So Shadowcaster's tech improvements were sloping floors and lighting and fog, and this engine looked better, you know, slightly better than the Wolfenstein 3D, but it just wasn't good enough for our next game. So John Carmack spent some months thinking about how more advanced this next engine really should be for this game that we decided to call Doom. And so based on the rapid development of our previous games, we came up with another important principle. We are our own best testing team, and we should never allow anyone else to experience bugs. <laughs> or see the game crash. So don't waste others' time. Test thoroughly before checking in your code. No throwing it over the fence for testers to find and put it in a bug database and fix it later. It's really a wasteful cycle. We didn't have QA back then, we just did it. So after 1992, its software second stage of company development was complete, along with another principle, which is core to programming. If as soon as you see a bug, you fix it. You don't keep working. <laughs> if you don't fix your bugs, your new code will be built on buggy code and ensure an unstable foundation. And if you check in buggy code, someone else is going to be writing code based on your bad code. And well, you know, you can imagine how uh, wasteful that's going to be. So the, the ideas for Doom came from our D&D campaign, which was full of demons. And we also really love the movies Evil Dead and Aliens. Doom's design was really a mashup of ideas, and at the beginning of Doom's development, we created <laughs> a new core principle. <laughs> Are you ready for all these? Uh, so use a development system that's superior to your target to develop your game. This is something that most and nobody did back then. I mean, before Doom, we're making games for DOS while developing on DOS computers. Like, of course, why wouldn't you? We knew that we could do better, though, if we used some powerful computers and a more advanced operating system to develop our games. So we developed Doom on Next Step workstations. They were far superior to DOS. <laughs> Next Step eventually turned into OS X, OS X, whatever you want to call it. Um, this also meant that one of our core principles was upheld. Great tools help make great games, and we could make way better tools on Next Step. So DoomEd and QuakeEd were two of the most important tools that we had. They both really helped us create levels and test them very quickly. Uh, you might not have known this, but we had five people on our team creating Doom. So after Tom Hall left in the middle of Doom, we hired Sandy Peterson and Dave Taylor, which brought us up to six people. <laughs> Unbelievably, while making Doom, we had to stop all production and we had to create the Super Nintendo port of Wolfenstein 3D as fast as possible. Um, we had a contract with a Japanese company. We asked a contractor to do the work. They did nothing. And then it became a panic situation right in the middle of Doom. So we just had to stop and learn the Super Nintendo. <laughs> learn the hardware. Um, we never had programmed a Super Nintendo before. And we had to convert the graphics to its format, the audio, all that stuff. So we were at peak id software uh, throughput at the time, and it took us three weeks. <laughs> I mean, we had to learn the hardware. <laughs> <laughs> so then we jumped into making Doom again. So we uploaded the shareware version of Doom to the University of Wisconsin server on December 10th of 1993, and the excitement for the game was unprecedented. People were creating files in the upload directory to, to, that were sentences like when dot will dot we see doom, right? <laughs> we were getting phone calls on our unlisted phone number <laughs> asking when it was going to be out. I don't know how people knew this. Anyway, time for another quick story. Uh, during the final day of Doom's creation, we worked 30 hours. <laughs> we crammed as many hours as we could. So we had the game running on all the computers in the office to ensure that it was solid. You don't just burn in, burn in that game. However, on a couple computers, the game just froze. The menu could pop up, but the gameplay just stopped moving. So John Carmack thought about what could possibly be happening. 
And he figured out this solution without doing any debugging. He just thought about it. And he was absolutely correct in his solution. And we finally uploaded this five minute bug fix. Uh, and then we tested it again. The bug had been in the game since we started making the game on day one. So at the beginning of 1994, I started working with Raven Software and developed Heretic using the Doom engine. And I wanted to see how an inventory system in a medieval version of Doom would play. And it turned out really great. Does anyone here remember Heretic? Yeah, all right. And we also made Doom 2 uh, in 1994. Yeah. Took us eight months. It was released on October, uh, sorry, September 30th, and we celebrated, we had a launch party on uh, October 10th. So in addition to this, we also did the Jaguar port of Doom ourselves. You guys remember the 64-bit Jaguar? But again, you know, we're multitasking, we're making multiple games, two games in 1993, three games in 1994. In 1995, we start working on Quake. We had nine developers, which is like four designers, two coders, and two artists, and I'm, I was going between coding and design. And I wrote QuakeEd and was experimenting with level design in 3D. Again, we just started with a clean code base. Uh, no code from Doom was using Quake, which was another one of our principles of development back then. Write your code for this game only, not for some future game. You're going to be writing new code later anyway because you're going to be smarter and you're not tying yourself down to the limitations of your past code. So get used to inventing new things all the time. In fact, back in the 80s, everyone wrote all the code for the games over and over again. If you ever remember the Ultima series, every Ultima was brand new. Um, so Quake's engine was de being developed at the time by John Carmack and the rasterization was by Michael Abrash. If anybody here knows who Michael Abrash is. He's a god. <laughs> All right, John Cash worked on the network code. He went on to become the lead programmer of World of Warcraft. Yeah. So time for another quick story. So this relates back to our belief that developing in a superior operating system can result in a better game. And while making Quake, we made a deal with Cray Supercomputers <laughs> to buy a Cray 6400 Super Server for half price. Our plan was to have our development team connected to it, to BSP and light our maps, as well as crunch any kinds of new data that we would create with whatever that next engine was gonna be. Um, and this computer room in uh, Quake's DM3 was gonna be full of Cray computers as a reference to the new hardware that we're gonna be getting. Um, unfortunately, Cray was bought by Silicon Graphics just before Quake was done and the whole deal fell apart. They just canceled all deals that were ongoing. So the computer room in Quake is filled with the usual rectangular mainframes instead of C-shaped crays. <laughs> so after publishing Heretic, I started working with Raven on Hexen. I wanted to see how an FPS would play with a hub level system and character classes. Um, and uh, Hexen was launched on October 30th of 1995 during this Deathmatch 95 event that was happening at Microsoft in Redmond. And a month later, I got Raven started on my next game design, which is called Hecatome. So it was going to be the third series, uh, third game in the series, Heretic, Hexen, and Hecatome. Hecatome was never finished, as you probably were wondering. <laughs> it was turned into actually Hexen 2, but it wasn't the same design that I made. Uh, during this time, we also noticed this small game company that was making some kind of cool games like uh, Raptor, Call of the Shadows, if you remember that. Um, and we brought them down from Illinois to make a game uh, that we would publish in our office. They called themselves Rogue Entertainment. About 14 months later, they released Strife, which uses the Doom engine. Yes, Strife! <laughs> it's an awesome RPG slash FPS. <laughs> uh, and it was really fun. It's like one of the first ones I've ever seen. And uh, it really showed that combining genres could actually make a really fun FPS and kind of add to it. And nowadays, you know, we have Destiny, uh, Destiny 2, and, and, and other FPS RPGs, but Strife was the very first one. Also, during 1995, we made the Ultimate Doom, which was a retail version of the mail-order-only Doom that we had made, um, and we added an extra episode to it. And then we also made Master Levels of Doom. Uh, so its software was still nine developers in size, and we released two games in 1995 while we're making Quake. And work continued on Quake 
uh, in 14 months after uh, starting, we released Q-Test on February 24th of 1996 for the world to test our internet gameplay. It was a deathmatch only demo. And during the next four months, we worked really hard to complete Quake. And we also released uh, Final Doom, which was created by Team TNT and the Casali brothers, and Death Kings of the Dark Citadel, which is an additional set of levels for Hexen. So one important principle that really helped us get Quake done faster was this, encapsulate functionality to ensure design consistency. We were using C, not C++. <laughs> Examples of this in Quake would be like the torches on the walls. We could have made level designers place a torch model and then a fire model that animated and then a torch sound entity all at the same location. But then if we needed to move stuff around, uh, something could just get left behind in the copy paste frenzy and you know, it was far easier for us to just create a torch entity that would just spawn all of the, that functionality at the same location. Um, also, back, you know, water in the game needed sound effects. They needed sound effect entities all over the place to fully cover entire bodies of water. Um, so you would hear the water everywhere. But, you know, if the water got modified in the level and moving all those entities around and deleting would have been just a mess. So it was easier just to make the game play water sounds when water was being rendered on the screen. So it was a renderer level feature and it was just out of the designer's hands. And it ensured consistency and it saved memory. Um, we didn't have to have all those entities out there. And we also did the same thing for the Sky Audio in Quake. So I released Quake Shareware on June 22nd uh, at 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, site. Time for another quick story. So while Michael Abrash was programming the renderer for Quake, he was interleaving CPU instructions with FPU instructions to calculate perspective correct texture mapping. And sometimes while he was playing the game, for just one frame, let's go on 60 frames a second, for one frame the game would show a completely different part of the map. And he isolated the only instruction where that could happen, and he determined that it was impossible for it to be an invalid value that would do that. So he had a friend from Intel come over to the office and go through his, his same exact analysis, and this friend absolutely agreed with him and told him that it was a known error with the floating point divide instruction on the Pentium. <laughs> it was a hardware error. There's nothing that we could do about it, so we just left it alone. <laughs> um, this bug is known as the Pentium FDiv bug, if you want to Wikipedia that. Uh, so Quake is a game that introduced the world to mouse look, which is just using your mouse to look around in full 3D. Um, introduced the world to a high-speed, true 3D world with perspective correct texture mapping and also internet multiplayer. So clans sprung up immediately, as did eSports and tournaments everywhere. And then Quake World launched five months later. And so making games was and still is our life. <laughs> still making games, even today. And we love it more than anything else, as you can tell by our release of 28 games in five and a half years by less than 10 people. So many other games were released that used our license technology over the years. Um, and here's a couple more of these core principles that we learned from all this work. So try to code transparently. Tell your lead and peers exactly how you're going to solve your current task and get feedback and advice. Do not treat programming like each coder is a black box. Project could go off the rails and cause delays. And programming is a creative art form based in logic. Every programmer is different and will code differently. Don't waste time focusing on a rigid coding style. It's really the output that matters. Thank you very much for listening to my story. <laughs> All right, so you might have some questions so we can do some Q&A and pass around a microphone. Yeah, we, oh. I know people <laughs> have some questions Hello? after that. Hello? Okay, who's going to go here. first? Um, Hello? Okay, okay. someone else. So we'll, we'll just alternate between these two. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, so how did you guys as programmers collaborate back then? Like, I'm thinking, uh, I mean, you didn't have Git, right? So what, what did you guys do? We had no source control. <laughs> yes. All right, we had floppies. Uh, and 
Yeah, we, backups were whatever the state of the game was on everyone else's computer. Uh, working together was great because we were all in the same room. We could just say, hey, uh, I just changed the header file for blah, 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 blah. Here, let me, just, you know, do you need it for the next five minutes or whatever? I'm about to change it. Uh, we just talked to each other in the same room. We weren't over an internet. We didn't even have an intranet at the very beginning. We just had floppies. Um, but luckily, at the end of our first year uh, in existence, we did get a file server, and we got Novell you know, 3.11 netware, and we got ourselves connected, and then we could actually just copy to, uh, to a file server. So that was very nice. Still no source control. No source control even from Quake. Like, didn't happen until like 2000, and then source safe, really. What was the bug that caused the game to freeze that you fixed without debugging? I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> it was bait. I just felt that obliged. Yeah, it was a mystery, wasn't it? So what happened was when, when you're making a game, you need to control the speed of the computer and the speed of everything in your game at a locked time uh, source, right? So on a PC, if you hook interrupt 8, that's your timer. That's your timer tick. And you can also speed up that timer tick. And we have to speed up the timer tick so we can DMA audio from, say, a hard, hard drive to the sound card uh, at the rate that you're trying to play audio. But you also have logic happening in the game, and you also have a renderer. So if we have a render thread running at, say, 35 frames a second, we have game logic running at another, at another uh, timer that's not 35 frames a second. Usually it's you know, a multiple. Sometimes it's a multiple of 70, usually. So Sound could be 140. Uh, the refresh is at 70 because that's what VGA monitors were at at the time. They weren't 60, it was 70 because they're CRTs. Um, and uh, 35 was the actual frame rate that we were going for, say, with Doom, because there was so much going on in the game that we would have one, one uh, 35th, uh, you know, one, you know, half of a frame. One frame <laughs> would be doing video, and the other frame would do logic and AI and all that stuff. So what happened was, there's a timer tick that counts, there's a, there's a variable that counts from zero on up for all the frames of, of, uh, of game code that's happening. It's using a timer tick value coming from the hardware, and that is a 16-bit value that goes up from zero to FFFF. Doom is a 32-bit program. <laughs> so what happens is it got, gets up to the very end of FFFF, and when we add one or we add whatever number to it, it's 32 bits, so it's going to go above that. The hardware will never hit that. The hardware will wrap around back to zero, and then your logic will never hit that high number, and you'll freeze. So what we needed to do was just clear the timer tick in the hardware so that number was never going to get that high. And then we could also, when we're getting up near that, at that limit, fix all of the values that were waiting for something that was too high. So that's, how we, that's what it was. It was a timer tick non-clear <laughs> of the, the BIOS value, um, and when we cleared it, then it fixed everything because all the calculations would always happen because they're still in 16 bits. Make sense? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to know. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about that source control thing, so I'm glad you answered that. Um, but since you guys are going so fast, how did you resolve either conflicts in architecture, you know, opinions, uh, you know, you're submitting the code on the floppy, and the guy's like, what's this, you know, how do you resolve those <laughs> things? <laughs> My favorite picture. <laughs> so, when we were coding stuff, we actually, like, owned part of the code, part of the game, so we wouldn't actually stop over each, stomp over each other's files. And if we were going to, we would talk to the other person and say, hey, I need to modify whatever, the memory manager or something like that. And then they would touch it, and then I would give them a copy of that after I modified it. So it was like clear communication. We're all in the same room. It's really easy to tell everybody what you're doing. Um, so we didn't ever merge. Like, we never needed to merge. No one was ever working on the same file at the same time. So we just gave updates to each other. Everyone gets updated to the same, same uh, version of the code, and everything went fine. And we never had a problem with it. We just made sure that we were talking to each other and that we didn't use the same files. Uh, hey, John. Uh, thank you for making a game that can literally run on anything. That's really cool. So, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome for the pregnancy test, Doom. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, I like, uh, I assume many of my colleagues here uh, have my own personal games and projects that I work on, but I find working in industry, it can be hard to balance my personal projects with uh, progress that I need to make uh, in my per professional life. So do you have any tips for someone who's looking to make meaningful progress on a personal project, a game, or something like that? Yeah, this is something I have to, I, I talk to a lot of game devs that um, they either like, they can't wait to like get money somewhere, like someone's gonna give them money, uh, they've never made a game before, and they think someone's gonna give them money. I always tell them, you need to do this on your own time. Like there's no way, no one's gonna ever give you money if you haven't proven that you can actually do something. So um, when you are interested in, in doing the, doing some, making a game or some kind of personal project on the side, you know it's gonna have to happen after work, or it's gonna happen on the weekend, but it's something that's gonna definitely take extra time. And as you can see, I, I don't know if I went into too much detail uh, in, during the talk, but like when we're making games, like our own games, we had a day job as well, and we would get in at 10 in the morning, and at six o'clock, we're done working on the game for the company for that we were working at. And then we switched directories and we start working on our own game until two in the morning. And then we go home. And we did that every day until we got that game done because then we could start a company. And it was just like, okay, we only need to do this craziness for one set of games or something that comes out that can then make money that we can then quit the job and go do that for real. So um, it's always gonna be a sacrifice of time. You know, it's always going to be how much time do you want to sacrifice and you just got to figure out even, even working for a little bit, even an hour a day is going to add up, you know. So even if you can just do an hour before you go to sleep or whatever, um, to make those personal projects happen, you've got to sacrifice. Thanks. <laughs> so I noticed you and your team were suspiciously happy and productive for a very long period of time. <laughs> 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 Which makes me think, at the very least, you didn't do anything with your like business side practices that like made you hate each other. So I'm kind of curious. Could you just comment on like a little bit of how the business stuff was running? Like, did you all divide up the revenue from every game, or and would you recommend that same practice to in Indie Shop today? Yeah. So when we started the company. Um, we did not have even distribution of our shares. Like we had four people in the company and we did not have, we had like, um, age, John and I had, me, John and, and Tom had 25% of the company and Adrian had 15% and then Jay, who basically just came in and just like balanced the checkbook every once in a while, he got 10%. And it just didn't seem fair that like Adrian is working all day with us. Why is he, he's an artist, but like why wouldn't he get the same percentage as us? Um, even if we're doing the engine and we're like doing all the cool code or whatever, it's like it just made sense that we're putting in our time and our best effort that we should all have equal ownership of the company. So I argued with Carmack about this and he did not want to, to, um, to do that, but I, I Finally wore him down, and we let Jay keep his 10%. We all went to 22.5% each, so all four of us had that. And then when we moved from uh, Shreveport to Madison, because Jay wasn't going to go with us, he lost his 10%, so then we all went to 25%. So we, were, we basically were only uneven for maybe a month or two before I got us to even parity. And so we kept it, you know, we kept everything as even as possible because we were spending all of our time together and it would just not feel fair to somebody that all this time is being spent but someone's getting less. Um, and when we were making money, we would put the money in the company. So we left it in the company's account. We didn't like split the money all the time. So um, the first year, by the end of 1991, the company was making 50,000 a month off of shareware games, which some people just couldn't believe uh, because it was, you know, shareware. <laughs> but, but we took the money and we just kept putting it in the bank account. At the very beginning when we almost had no money, 
we only took out the money that each person needed. So Tom Hall needed more money than I did and more money than Carmack, so we just gave Tom Hall more money. And it didn't matter to us that he needed more money. As long as the company had enough money to take care of everybody, that's all that mattered. We didn't need to get paid back later when we got more money or anything. It was all about us being able to do what we were doing and everybody you know, being happy with the situation, not worrying about financial stress. And eventually, you know, after a couple of months, we could then buy all new PCs and, and, uh, and then a file system later on. And just all the money that we made, we just put it in the company. So when we originally started, we were making 27000 a year <laughs> each. And then we, um, we went up to 45000 when we were making Wolf and like Wolfenstein launched, made a quarter million its first month. We're like, hey we could go up to 45K. <laughs> and then after the summer where that was like, two, you know, that, that much money was, was not that much compared to what the game was making when it really ramped up, then we went up to 60K. Uh, so then we stayed at 60K each until Doom launched, which was insanity at that point. And then we decided, let's get up to 100K each. And then we decided that we weren't going to go any higher than that because then we, we could have a, just a stable financial prediction at that point. And anything above that, we would decide to, to split it every quarter. We would figure out how much money could we split, leave tons of money in the bank. Like we would want a whole year's worth of money in the bank. And then like split what we could um, evenly depending on how much ownership. Because we started giving ownership away in the company to some of the other people that have been with us for a while. Um, but we all, we all did it as a group and we kept as much money in the bank as possible because if we need new computers, like, hey, let's buy, you know, seven next step machines. Like, that wasn't a problem. They were 10,000 bucks each, but we had all the money in the bank, so we just get them. So making stuff and not having a problem making stuff was more important than us having a bunch of money in our own personal accounts. Great. Thank you. And would you say that's how you would tell shops to do it today also? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you run a company, it's really important that the company has money to keep on running and it's not a month to month, <laughs> you know, you don't want to be worrying every single month, so you want to just like bank as much as you possibly can. So yeah, we're, we still run things like that. Great, thanks. Sort of a follow-up question, a uh, small high-performing team, how did you decide when to hire somebody and then how did you decide who to hire? Well, let's see, um, we decided to hire um, Sandy and Dave probably about three years after we started making games together. So we hired some new people. We, actually, we hired Jay and Kevin in, um, in April of 1992 because we need a biz guy and we needed more work on art because Wolfenstein 3D was turning out to be a lot of art for Adrian to do. Like, if you remember, there were 13 games made in 1991 and we had one artist to do all the art for those games. He worked all the time. <laughs> so he was like, he was worked like a borrowed mule, basically. So he was, he was but he loved it. You know, he had a lot of fun. Um, but we, you know, we just, there was so much more work with rotating, you know, characters and animating that we had never done in a previous game because, hey, we're in 3D now, um, that we needed another artist and that's why we hired Kevin. He was already, uh, he'd been a really great artist at Softdisk and he was a, uh, a manager that we were, you know, communicating with on all the games that we were doing for Softdisk at the time. So we decided to hire him, and I hired Jay out of Softdisk as well, but I'd known Jay since 86. Uh, we'd gone back even before Softdisk. So we brought those two on. We already knew who those people were. They're really great, and they, Kevin Cloud is still with the software today after, what, 30 years. He'd been there since 1992. He's still there. And I email him often. Thanks. Yeah. This uh, demon-filled D&D campaign that helped inspire Doom. Can you tell us a little about it? What was your character in it? <laughs> so, it's funny because the campaign wasn't full of demons until I made that happen, unfortunately. <laughs> um, we, it's, uh, so, you know, just from looking at the, the technology that we created that 
there's a crazy genius behind the programming of this technology is John Carmack, right? Um, John also was so genius that he was probably the best dungeon master I'd ever played with. And so John had created this world that had hundreds of characters in it that all had different levels of power and different interconnections, different motives, and it was a really um, complex world. It was not like murder hoboing through the game all the time. You're, you, know, you have to think before you do something because you might be affecting some other political situation. So it was a very complex world that we were playing in that John you know, had been creating and playing for at least five years. So while we're in this world, and we're kind of like low level still, you know, level five or level six, when we get to a, a point where I have to hide out in a pocket dimension because there's some really bad characters looking for us. And the other, the other people had to hide out as well. I just luckily hid out in this like castle in a dimension that no one could get to that this guy named Vade owned. Um, and so Vade had uh, this book called the Demonicron, which could summon demons, and he could ask them questions, and he could possibly have them do things for him um, because they were they they couldn't escape the pent the pentagram that he had that that he summoned them in, and uh, and I was because I was just like there, and I was starting to learn some basic magic um, on my own. John actually let let people uh, learn like dual classing, but also learn spells that you just make up but you have to prove that you're working at them. So I was making up a pretty cool spell, and while um, Vade was summoning a demon this one time, the demon was talking to him, but telepathically telling me, I can get anything I want if I can just give him that book. <laughs> so I'm like telepathically thinking back to him, um, what, what do you have, you know? And so I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you later, the next time Vade summons the demon, it tells me there's a plus five ancient Daigatana <laughs> and a ring of vampiric regeneration and some other artifact I don't remember. And I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> so I use the spell on Vade to incapacitate him and throw the book because it would only stop him for a couple seconds. Throw the book over and the demon has this book and the demon now can escape the pentagram. And he's just, he goes to like 10 times the size and it's like, uh, mistake. <laughs> and, and he basically, he's just like, here's, here's your stuff, but it won't matter anyway, because you're all dead. So over the next two months of playing the game every weekend, the world is being flooded with demons onto the prime material plane, and everyone in John's world, all the powerful characters, everybody is just going down slowly every weekend until demons just own the whole place and we're all dead. I was dying over and over again, but my little ring was re regenerating me, and I'm getting shredded apart again. It's kind of like, um, you know, Doctor Strange when he's in front of, uh, <laughs> of I can't remember the name, Damaru, Damaru, whatever, and he's getting destroyed over and over again. That Don't happened. But anyway, that was the story of how the world got flooded with demons, and then later on we're like, hey, uh, well, actually, so we stopped playing D&D &D after that because the world was gone. <laughs> that was the end of D&D &D for id Software. But it was the beginning of Doom because, hey, what a cool idea. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's how Doom's uh, demon-flooded, you know, Phobos uh, anomaly was, was created from that idea. Thank you. Yeah, good question. <laughs> By the way, this photo up here, this was on the cover of a magazine back in 1994. <laughs> We actually sell this poster on our site. <laughs> so we've now seen Doom run on all kinds of technology. What was the origin story for Does It Run Doom? Jeez. Um, we released the source to Doom in 1997, um, and then people started putting it on different things other than different major operating systems like Linux. Like, they started to make it run on other things. and. Uh, and I think that when it ran on an ATM, I think that's when people were like, hey, this is pretty crazy. <laughs> and, and then people decided to go weirder, you know, like, it's on a piano. Uh, 
the keys on the piano control front, back, left, right, firing, all this stuff. So someone's like making the worst song ever while they're playing the game. Um, and then it just kind of went from there. And uh, because it's so portable and simple, um, the, the inner loop on Doom that renders the screen, which is, we called it a span blitter, which is vertically rendering columns of, of uh, pixels. So Doom is not rendered horizontally like this. It's rendered vertically across the screen. And uh, that inner core loop is in C. So whatever the platform is, you would normally convert that into assembly language for the chip that it's on to make it go really fast. But chips are so fast that people just leave it in C now. <laughs> Um, and that's why it can just easily run on anything, because no matter what, there's no assembly involved in any of it if you don't want it to, to be, you know, to be there. So, yeah, I think that the ATM was the beginning of it, and for me, the really impressive Doom uh, versions that I've seen are the ones that actually run on VIC-20 or really old computers, because that's actually hard to do. Making it run on chips today like a pregnancy test, not really that big of a deal. <laughs> Because uh, those chips are today's chips, like there, there's lots of memory and everything, but going back to pre, you know, 10 years before Doom was made and making it run on those computers was really, really hard. But yeah, there's, there's a, I think it's DesertRunDoom.com, which has just the list of everything. <laughs> uh, right. As you talk through those principles, they really were kind of like just a snapshot in time of, of you know, some insight that you had working as this team very closely. And I, I find myself wondering, like, did you ever find that you needed to retire or amend a principle? Or did you ever think you had some insight that turned out to be just a really bad idea that you had to kind of, you know, let go of? Um, well, like the prototype one, <clears throat> the funny thing is that sometimes that prototype one does work. Like, if you already have a really clear idea, and you have the experience that has, you know, that, that goes behind the idea, then making that prototype really doesn't need to happen if you already can see the game and you already know that you've done something kind of similar. Um, but most of the time, you're always making prototypes. Like even in modern game development today, um, there's this, uh, it's almost like prototype-driven development for a game today where you would create a white box level that's called a gym, G-Y-M, and you would make a gym for a facet of your engine. Usually it's a feature. So if you were moving around and, and you have specific ways of moving, you would just make a white box that has all kinds of interesting you know, architecture that you would be moving around in. It's called a movement gym. And if you have a system for uh, magic or you have a system for something, you would, make a, you would make a gym just to showcase that one thing. You'd set it up just to showcase that one feature. And so you're basically proving all of these little features out in these gyms instead of hoping they all work together. Of course, the whole game actually is making it all work together, but you can really, spe you can really get to the debug of a thing without all the complexity of the entire game running if you just use these gyms. So prototyping actually happens almost through like the entire vertical slice of a game nowadays where you're just testing thing after thing. You could end up with like 30, 40 gyms of prototypes. So it's the safest way to develop now. <laughs> Back then, we weren't being safe. We were just making things. So <laughs> and we knew that we could do it, and we didn't have that much time. There was no time for prototypes because we had to deliver something every two months or one month or whatever. Um, but, uh, but I guess you get good at knowing what you can do, scoping and all that stuff, when you do it over and over and over and over again. Thank you. So. Uh, I noticed in the principles that you described, a number of them were about um, programming techniques uh, or tools that helped uh, you and your dream team be successful. One of the things that I was wondering was whether there were any principles that you can think of that apply to uh, human cooperation and the way that your teams were, the, the, the team that you had, were able to be as effective and productive and creative as they were. <clears throat> well, it helped. It helped back then that each person, like we had a really small team, and each of each of us were in charge, clearly in charge of a certain thing. Um, Tom Hall was in charge of of he was the creative director. So, like what whatever game he wanted to make, we were going to make it. For us, it was like we were trying to fulfill a contract that went on for a year at the very beginning of Id Software's first year. So we weren't really 
like invested in whatever the game was at the very beginning because it was written for someone else and we were just there to get those things done, but we're also gonna get really good at making stuff. So um, Tom was just coming up with game after game after game. He just came up with all the games that year and we were just making them. And then when it came to, um, we were out of that contract and we could do our own stuff, then it was time for us to like all of us agree on making whatever the next thing is because it's gonna be a time investment and it's gonna be for our company versus this thing that we're trying to help another company with. Because when we left Softdisk, we, we just took off and it's like, oh, you have a lot of people that paid you for a whole year's worth of games and we just left. So let's not, let's not get you guys in trouble. So we made games for them for a year. Um, but when it came down to like, okay, now we can make our own stuff and we can take as much time, which is Wolfenstein, what are we gonna make? And uh, and so that's when we needed to kind of agree together what we were going to do. And when I came up with the idea to make Wolfenstein, they all immediately agreed to it because we all knew what we were going to make. Like immediately could see it. We lived Castle Wolfenstein from you know, 1981 on up to that point. It was an incredible game. And, uh, and so we could just see it. Uh, but, but working together was um, everybody was super respectful of each other. There was no, uh, nobody ever would yell at each other. Like, that just doesn't fly. Um, and everybody just respected each other because each of us had so much knowledge uh, of game development for 10 years before that point that, you know, uh, like, I wouldn't try and tell John Carmack what to do with the engine. Like, it just wouldn't make sense. Unless he couldn't do something I needed, I would just tell him, well, here's how I would do it. And if that worked with his code, then great. And if it doesn't, then we have to forget doing it or try and find another way of doing it. But, uh, but it was always, everyone was super respectful of each other. There was no yelling. It was just being very professional, which you usually don't find in a really small indie <laughs> group. But, uh, but that's what we were like. So, and, and we also liked being with each other. We liked uh, being friends with each other. Um, our current company is, is basically the same way. We have like 20 some people. And we all like hanging out together. Um, and that just comes from each of us, you know, everyone in the company is hiring the next person together. It's not like some person hires someone randomly. And it's like, who's this? Um, it's always everybody is involved in hiring the next person. And the hiring process is like probably the most important thing in our company, you know, where we're going to bring somebody else in. So even when we get to the point where we like the person that we want to hire, we go through a process of, okay, now why do we not want to hire this person? What's wrong with them? And so we have to go through social media, we have to go through background checks that they didn't list, because uh, we know everybody. <laughs> and you know, basically just like, what's wrong with this person? And if we can't find anything wrong, it's like, this is great. All right, you know, let's, let's hire them. Um, and so they get through the gauntlet. And, uh, but it's, but, but it's, you know, we're trying to find a personality match and somebody that we would want to hang out with. And, uh, and that's like, that's, that's kind of like we lucked out at the very beginning with id Software. We all liked doing what we did, and we had the same passion level, which is critically important for a startup at the beginning, that everybody is, is, is equally invested and in putting in all that time. Because as soon as one person doesn't, everyone else is looking at them going like, what? <laughs> so it's just uh, get lucky, I guess. <laughs> Thanks very much. So after you started licensing your engines, it resulted in some amazing and absolutely ridiculous games. Do you have any opinion on, for example, Super 3D Noah's Ark? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because that was such a, just like a, a copy of source code for us. Um, and at that time, we were not gonna like, well, let's not license it to them. Like, we're all atheists, and here's a company that wants to make a religious game. I don't care, go ahead, <laughs> have fun. You know, it was, I don't even remember how much it was. It was pretty cheap. But, um, you know, we would, it was just like, all right, we got another license. Like, that was actually more important to us than, like, whatever the game was that they were going to make. Um, that was, I think, a company called Wisdom Tree that made that, where you, you feed some sleep food to the animals that are going to attack you, and then you're making everything sleep. You're not shooting. It was really dumb. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was, it was a fun game for some people. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, even in your uh, presentation, we saw a, a slow but steady increase in the development time of games. And, and even today, we're seeing you know, games take five, six years, have a 
800 people working on them. Um, do you see there coming a point where it kind of a, reaches a critical mass and there's, there's a, ma a, a big problem there? I mean, these are even built on pre-made engines and that sort of thing, and yet we seem to have ever more increasing development time and problems uh, producing games. Yeah, the, um, the games that are that big are they're very calculated moves by big publishers to invest that much money. Um, games like Assassin's Creed, which is a massive franchise that has at least 1,500 people making it across about 30 to 40 companies all working together. It's not just Ubisoft, but like all of Ubisoft satellite studios, uh, outsource companies doing art and, and uh, sometimes code, cinematics, you name it. Um, they know they're going to make that money back. And if you look at something like, say, Call of Duty, when Call of Duty comes out, you know, they usually spend two years on a Call of Duty game that costs, you know, maybe a hundred million bucks, but they make a half a billion the, the week that it releases. So they know they're gonna make that money back. So it's not like they have to worry about that risk assessment on a Call of Duty game. Um, a new IP is a risk. You know, a new thing that is not part of a franchise is the biggest risk, and they always have to go in and look at the mechanics of the game and all parts of it to go, what do we think this is gonna sell? Like the market it's gonna hit, it's very complex because sometimes new IP tries to get it a new kind of market or new gameplay that you can't really perfectly calculate because you're having to like look at overlaps and everything between markets. So um, games do get big, but you know, Minecraft was made with one person and it revolutionized everything. And that can still happen today. So, um, you know, a lot of times, the in, like I look at the indie, uh, the, the indie scene as all the really cool ideas are coming from there, and all the big franchises are the safe bets, but they're trying to push in small ways their own, you know, their own game in some way. Like a new feature might come out, like the battle royale frenzy that happened recently with player underground battle, you know, player player unknown battlegrounds, um, and then Fortnite, you know, copying it. Um, and that just started a whole thing. Uh, there's a VR gold rush that's over now. Um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that people get excited about. Now it's metaverse, you know. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff people get excited about. And they always have to calculate what, what they could get from it. And a lot of times, it's, they're going to get nothing. The money is just going to be gone uh, sometimes just because it's, it's like making a movie. You don't know. Um, but you try and you try and predict and calculate as much as possible in these really big games. Usually when they put that kind of money into a game, it's already known what they're gonna get when, it's, when it comes out. So like the really big stuff that people spend all that money on, don't worry about those games not making the money back, because <laughs> they usually do. It's the games that are like in the 20, you know, 10 to 30 million dollar range that are the, the ones that may be more iffy. Thank you so much for your time and thanks for being here. Uh, what test strategies did you have to make sure uh, on your code? Uh, how did you make sure code had been tested uh, enough or that kind of thing? And also, uh, how did management work or did you have any non-technical managers um, for, for developers or that kind of thing? Okay, so um, testing strategies for our games was, was uh, like that's one of the most important things that we could do on our games is play the game. And you know, there's a lot of times where developers are not playing the games. They're like, they're just working and coding and stuff. Um, and you know, the game has a lot of bugs because they're not actually running the thing that they're coding. Or they're just running the, the thing and not trying to hurt it because you coded it. But like you need to ruin your code. And, and so like when, we're, when we were making our stuff, we were trying to break it at the same time and we played our games over and over again, I mean, thousands of times we're, we're playing our game, like Doom, for a year. I don't know how many thousands of times I ran the game. And that's just like, it's, it's, it's playing it, but also trying to mess it up by doing things that you, you know, hope that the engine might not have covered. And, uh, and so it's just like willful destruction of your code. <laughs> and if there's a QA team, at least for programmers, especially like from back then when they get to the assembly language level, it's almost like a pride thing where no one should see anything that is messed up that you wrote. You know, because then it's just like, you look at somebody else's like, well, 
yeah, well, if you were good, you know. <laughs> but, so we would always, we, it was like a challenge. Like, you should not have anything wrong with your code, and you don't want anyone else, because if somebody finds a bug, you're like, oh, God, you know. We used to send, like, laughing dog, you know, GIFs and some GIFs, whatever you want to say, to each other. Um, and, uh, and, and it's just like a good-natured fun. But, like, when we were making those games, we played them over and over again. And any bugs that are in Doom are bugs that we did not find while playing the game. And they're really esoteric things that are rare to, 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 to find. And, and once they're found, you can do them over and over again. But um, they're not things that would happen normally when anyone's playing the game. And they, they weren't fixed. After we found them, they weren't fixed because... People who are really good, we figured they should use those tricks to, to you know, as, as a thing that kind of um, helps them out just a little bit. Because they weren't like really big helpful things. But it was so rare to find anything. Um, and it's because we ran our stuff over and over again. So it's really critical to just run your own, your own project or whatever over and over and try to put bad data in and just try and ruin it. We never did unit testing, like the unit testing didn't exist. We had no idea what that was. Um, you know, back then we could actually debug with hardware breakpoints. You know, if something was wrong, variable was getting trashed somewhere, we could put a hardware breakpoint on the memory location of the variable, and when something happened, hardware debugger pops up. You know, and we could see what that instruction is accessing. What is it? You know, and so it was easy to find that stuff. Now it's all the layers of abstraction make it really hard to to, to figure out that stuff. Um, and with management, there wasn't any management. So we didn't have a producer to keep track of the project. We didn't have any managers at all to talk to people about anything. It was just, it was a hive mind situation where we were all working together on the same thing. But it was such a small team that we didn't really need to do you know, anything like that. When we were making Quake, which at the time for me at the company was the biggest, I was in charge of the design team and John was in charge of the coding team, which are three other people on both, both of our sides. Like he's got three people to his right, and I got three people to my left, and that was everybody. And, um, and the other couple of extra people were you know, art and stuff, which they were owners of the company. They don't need somebody to tell them what to do. So um, we just managed ourselves, so we didn't have to have any, anyone else in there. Very rare situation. <laughs> Uh, so, I just wanted to start by saying thank you so much for giving me the escape that I desperately needed uh, throughout the 90s, so that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, also, sadly, I finally just actually paid for Quake, so yay. But, yeah. <laughs> um, no, the question I have is, how much were you all paying attention to the demo scene? Say that again? The demo scene, like, uh, I don't know if you were paying attention to that at all, like what's going on in Europe in the 90s? Yeah, yeah, so we, we were definitely aware of the 80s demo scene because we've, I mean, I've worked on multiple computers back then. Commodore 64 is really where a lot of that started with, and also the Atari 800. Um, but we didn't, like we knew how the demo, like we knew how that code worked, but it wouldn't help us in our game because our game is not like these really tight, cycles of assembly language doing mathematically interesting calculations. It's like we have to have code that works on a lot of data and it, none of it is tricks really. It's like a demo scene stuff, but we have kept track of it for a really long time. I mean, uh, there's a lot of really cool demo scene stuff still happening today. Um, and I still haven't been to assembly yet, which I think takes place in Helsinki or something. And it's like one of the coolest shows ever. Um, but I do download those, those 64K <laughs> demos or even some that were really big that do like mind-blowing stuff. Um, but the demo scene was always something that was really interesting. And I know some of the people from the demo scene went on to make Max Payne and some other uh, really cool games. So yeah, I mean, really good programmers are in the demo scene. Awesome, thank you. Hi, um, I was uh, reminded of a phrase, it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> so I wanted to know if you happen to have any favorite happy accidents while you were developing? Well, let's see, the, um, the bug that is now a feature, <laughs> <laughs> um, in Doom, like I had mentioned, that there were some things that we didn't test uh, that we left in the game. One of them is um, when you, when you as a, the player got one sound channel, we didn't like, if the player if the player was going to 
press the um, use button on a wall, we didn't want that to happen on a bunch of channels of audio, you know, like 10, eat up 10 or even like max out the amount of available channels. We wanted to just keep it on one channel and just stop the current sound plane and start the next one over just stomping over itself. Um, because then it didn't eat up all these channels which could mess up the game and it would sound really bad if you have all these monsters moving around and you know all this other stuff is happening and you were just trashing it with using the fire button or you know or the use button on the wall so because the player only had one channel for their audio you could you could uh, when you fired a gun you know the gun sound happens um, on the same channel that when you press the use button happens. So that doesn't mean, that doesn't matter really, except for when you talk about the BFG. Because when you press the button to launch the BFG, it takes maybe a half to a quarter second before you hear something, because it's a buildup, and it's a really big, you know, weapon. So during that buildup, you can press spacebar on a wall and kill the sound of the BFG launching which in deathmatch is pretty great because nobody knows it's coming. <laughs> so it's called the silent BFG trick where um, somebody could be down a hall and just you're, you're like right next to the hall. So you press the BFG button and immediately press the use button and then you just walk out and it just launches this silent big green ball down the hallway. <laughs> and then if you want to, to, to be even worse, if there's another place where you can see run down that hallway while the green ball is going this way. You run down the hallway to another hallway, and when the green ball hits the wall over there, you kill everybody in front of you in this hallway because of the way the BFG works. It sends out a bunch of damage rays. When it impacts the wall from where you're at, it sends out damage rays. <laughs> so you can launch it over here, run over here, and then kill everybody, and they're like, what just happened? <laughs> So like pros, Doom pros, do that all the time. Silent BFG, and you can hear someone doing a silent BFG. So it's, if you're really good, you'll know that they're doing that. You know, so there's a lot of psychology in really high-level Doom play. Um, and I actually still play Doom Deathmatch at tournaments all over the world, still. Uh, so there's all those stupid tricks happen <laughs> constantly. Thank you. All right. So you mentioned always starting fresh for every game and yeah. not using any of the old code, but wouldn't you want to just find yourself copying and pasting certain things that you'd written, or w would you always just truly write everything fresh? So uh, we would keep really foundational stuff that would be dumb to rewrite. File loading, you know, like <laughs> there's some things you just don't need to rewrite unless there's a new feature like, hey, we can do asynchronous loading now or something. But typically, those low-level STL type things, we would just keep some of those things because why would we waste our time? We would write the same code again, so of course we're just gonna copy it. But when it came to any higher level code, there's always a new way of doing a state machine or there's always a new way of doing something. So at some point, we're just like, we're not gonna use the memory manager anymore. Like one of the first pieces of code when we started, um, when we started in software and we started writing all of our own engine stuff again, the first thing we wrote was a memory manager. And the memory manager would, you know, you would pass in the address of the pointer that you were going to, to, to get memory from. So it can move that, that pointer, like that memory around in memory and change the value that the pointer was pointing at. And that actually worked out really, really well. But at some point, it was like, let's just use C, malloc and stuff. Like, the, there's enough memory now. Like, we get into 32 bits and it's like, forget it. There's tons of memory. We don't need to, like, micromanage the blocks of memory in the 640K space. Um, so we would do you know, some of that. Like as an example, in the 80s, um, in Ultima, like Ultima was, was written from scratch every time, except for that tile draw routine, which didn't need to be rewritten because there was no way that the hardware was going to change and there's no way to make that faster. Like that was the fastest unrolled tile draw, draw code that existed you wouldn't try and rewrite that because it's already been analyzed by every assembly language programmer to be performant and not, you can't even pull a cycle, an extra cycle out of it. So some things you would keep. Um, and sometimes we actually did use some of the same code, like uh, because of the amount of time it took to make Catacomb 3D, which was only two months, but you know, it was like we, we knew how, John knew how to do 
the you know to to get a 3D uh, display up pretty quickly using ray casting from Hover Tank, which is the very first one. So we could use the idea of Hover Tank's ray casting. He didn't need to he didn't need to um, come up with those ideas anymore, but he could he could optimize the code for that the next time he wrote it. But then he had to write like texture mapping code. So some of it was useful, but most of it had to be redone because of the texture mapping. Then when we go to Wolfenstein, um, it's like, why are we going to rewrite all of the re rendering stuff from Catacomb again to Wolfenstein? There's no reason. So let's take as much as we can and keep, keep it, but we had to modify it because now it's a VGA, which is a completely different renderer. But the idea of span splitting these columns is still there, and we're still ray casting. And it's just now we have to use some tricky chain four mode VGA rendering to make things go faster. But so we didn't, it wasn't 100%. It was probably, you know, we kept maybe 15%, something like that. But most all of the rest of it had to go. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to stop here. But right. thank you so much, John. That was excellent. Thank you. <laughs>